<laughs> Look right at me. So at this point, I will introduce a very important person who has been um, not single-handedly because he has a big team and he has very good leadership skill. That's why our dear friend Jim Wong Chu particularly wanted him to carry on the work and get everybody to rally around him to do this work. Please put your hands together for Alan Cho. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me at the back there? Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Cho. Uh, I am the festival uh, director of uh, Literation. But I, I feel that I'm a festival director in name only. Um, our uh, founder and uh, festival director um, up to March was um, Jim Wan Chu. And he was instrumental in uh, creating the festival, founding it, and also uh, really his fingerprints are all over our program uh, for this festival in 2017. He selected, uh, invited, and he curated the program for much of the, the festival that we see here. Um, so I cannot thank um, um, Jim enough for all that he's done um, for us. Um, so I'd like to thank you uh, for all joining us uh, for this festival. It's going to be a very fun festival. Uh, it's going to be a four-day festival. Tomorrow we're going to be having a reception where we announce the, uh, the new Jim Wong Chu Emerging Writer Award. And also we're going to be uh, launching uh, the new uh, rice paper uh, anthology called Currents as well. So a number of things happening. Of course, Saturday will be, as I said earlier, uh, a number of uh, great uh, uh, authors will be coming. And then a whole series of workshops will be happening on Sunday, along with Word Vancouver uh, and a number of great partners. So I want to thank you all for uh, coming to uh, the beginning of our 2017 Literation Festival. There's going to be so much more happening. I'd like to thank you all for uh, Start things right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to hand it back to Winnie. And Ellen, are we ready with the little video? Oh, yes. Yes. So we are going to um, show a short video on Jim Wang Chu, um, somebody that we all miss and many of you know. And so we are going to start things right by having a little tribute to him. How do we describe writers? And it's the same thing I've said before. Uh, I took a whole bunch of photographs, but then what makes me a photographer? Anyone can take a photograph. Anybody can be a writer. And that's why I keep saying to people, anybody can write. You know, but what makes you a writer? A writer is one that puts a lot more sweat equity, you know, perseveres and tries to get her own book, she has her own book published. That's what it makes you a writer. But the whole idea is that anybody can write. And we, we try to encourage people to, to you know, take that on. And even this, in this new generation, 20 years after, we're still pioneering because there's a whole generation of new writers out there writing completely different things, you know, diverse in ideas and thoughts. And it's the very first time that you actually see the emergence of a, li a true literature that was not just confessional, not about the past, not about ourselves personally, but about things, about what we look at and how we see ourselves. So I think it's unique um, and, you know, and from here, we're going to have to transform it much further than that. And what we need to do is that we need to then encourage you know, this new generation of people to not just get involved with writing their own material, but to try to somehow give, you know, put themselves in the situation to help the rest of the community. Because if you look at 20 years ago, we had nothing. You know, it's not too far ago. And so, you know, we still got quite a bit of ways to go. And that's the work that we have to do. I first met Jim probably 20 years ago. And uh, soon after, he invited me to edit Rice Paper, even though I had no experience and <laughs> perhaps no gift for it. But um, it was a way for him to get me to challenge myself and to believe in myself and to expand 
my ways of thinking about writing and to be part of a community. I am forever grateful to Jim for everything and uh, for supporting me and so many so early on um, and, and believing that we had something of value to say. words about the format tonight. We're going to have about 10 minutes for each author, including my little introduction. And then we'll leave quite a bit of time for question and answer because you want to hear from you and get your questions as well. And um, before I jump right into introducing the individual writers, I just want to make sure that even though you might know many of them, either in person or because you read the book and you saw the photograph, so, uh, because when I'm introduced to two persons at the same time and they're very similar, I always get them mixed up. So I want to make sure that um, by identifying them up front now, then you will know exactly who they are, even though they're not seated in the way they're going to be introduced later um, when I invited them to uh, read from their book or talk about their book. So from the far end is Catherine, Catherine Hernandez all the way from Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us here. And um, the next three authors are all locals. And the, um, sitting next to Catherine is a voice that many of you know very well. <laughs> Jan Sukfong Lee. <laughs> yeah. And Julia Lin, who is a member of, uh, you were on our board on ACW before, and uh, very happy that this time, you're not working, but we are working to promote your book. And uh, on my left, immediate left, is Jenny Zhang. Uh, I believe we have the same surname, even though we spell it different. <laughs> um, so without much ado, I'm going to quickly get into a very, very brief introduction so that there's more time uh, for you to hear from the writer herself. Uh, Catherine, um, I was given um, a very short description of your bio, and I got so interested as I was reading your book and reading more about you on the internet that I ended up with, with something like five pages. And I was just so fascinated. You're not just a writer, much more than a writer. So I'm going to re refrain from my five pages. <laughs> There's an impulse to say more. So I'm going to keep to just a very brief bio. And in her own words, she said, she's a proud queer woman of color, a radical mother, an activist, a theater practitioner, and a performer, a writer, an artistic director of a theater. She also has a one-woman show, as well as um, she uh, has produced, co-produced at the Sulan Theater. Now, this is a very brief introduction, but I encourage you to get to know the other Catherines, uh, other than the writer. But today, we want to focus on the writer. Would you like to um, take it off? Yeah, please. Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Excellent. It's weird. I feel like this is a weird like, conference to tell people about some bad news about the public health. Um, <laughs> doesn't seem like that. It's like, guys, bad news. Don't eat the oysters. <laughs> um, it is such a joy to be here. Thank you so much to Literation Festival for inviting me here. Um, I love the city. I haven't been here in a very long time. And the last time I was here was uh, actually to perform in an awful show, awful, awful show, um, in which I, I played a very um, submissive Asian person who's very thankful to be here in Canada. So I'm very happy to be here under my own terms um, with um, uh, a lot of the Asian community here, um, proud and, and loud. So I'm going to be reading from my book, Scarborough. Uh, which is pu published by Arsenal Pulp Press. Um, 
and uh, it's about how a literacy center sets up shop in the lower income part of Toronto, which is in the east side, and its impact on three children over the course of a school year. Um, however, it has several different uh, points of view, including Edna's, who is a Filipina esthetician, and so she describes her day. I have long days. The day started with a 10 o'clock appointment with the cop. He always comes in on his days off. Good morning, Officer Tindall, I said when he came in today out of uniform. He nodded. He enjoys seeing me feel afraid of him. I decided a long time ago to never really look him in the eye. Instead, my eyes were on the footpaths I was filling with bleach and warm water to start the day. You ready for me? His face winced at the smell of bleach. This made me happy. He had scheduled a waxing appointment. This was different from his usual manicure when, as I do with any client, I unbutton his shirt cuff to reveal his entire forearm. With my right hand, I pump lotion onto my fingers. Of course, the pump is only half full of dollar store grade lotion. Of course, the lotion splatters across my thighs. Of course, Officer Tyndall says, oh, is this getting personal, Edna? I do not respond. I begin massaging the sinew along his forearms towards the bend of his elbow and keep my eyes down to avoid seeing the creases of his lips unturned, smirking at me. My thumbs make their way to his palms, making circles along his lifeline. His smirk grows bigger. If you can do this with my hands, who knows what you can do with elsewhere, he says. I do not respond. I never respond, and still, he always says it. Today, he had asked for a back wax and headed to the facial rooms. I close the door behind me. My girlfriend likes me real smooth all over, you know? He started to remove his striped golf shirt, revealing a turtleneck of hair from the bottoms of his earlobes to above the crack of his bum. I shuddered, and I had not even finished rolling out the paper on the surface of the waxing bed, and he had flopped his body face down like a child waiting for his bedtime story and for me to tuck him in. I stamped my latex gloves into place. I checked the consistency of the wax by dipping a tongue depressor in and out of the pot like caramel, hot caramel. I shook baby powder across his torso to make it look like Christmas. Then I began to apply the hot wax along the direction of the hair growth. He moaned since I refused to cool the liquid down one bit. If he were another client, I would have blown on the wax before applying it, but I was enjoying his pain too much. Once he was covered from nape to neck, I began my torture. I chose the largest patches of linen strips I could find to begin the pulling process. From the small of his back, I pressed the linen into the wax and pulled the hair from the root, like an ugly carpet in an ugly house that I wanted to demolish. <laughs> oh, he began screaming with every pull, and with every pull I thought of the times his knees made their way between my legs underneath the manicure table. <laughs> Ouch! I thought of the times he leaned into me to smell into my ear. Shit, God, that hurts! I thought of all the times he handed me my one dollar tip and winked at me. Jesus, please, it hurts! Stop! I did not. I did not stop until he was as hairless as a newborn mouse. I turned him over and I did it all over again on his chest. I noticed his eyes tearing up and in the most sing-song, docile voice, I said to him, Oh, Officer Tindall, are you crying? He buried his face into his elbow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, that is actually a, a true story because I was an esthetician, and, um, but it was with a fireman. <laughs> That's right. You don't mess with me. Um, <laughs> Now, okay, if, if you don't mind, um, uh, just uh, aside from the book, I just knew that I was not going to really ever read in front of this many Asians ever again in my life, so I'm hoping that you're okay with me reading something else that I'm hoping will um, feel really good um, for us Asian females in the room. Um, so I am the thinker in residence at Buddies and Bad Times Theater. And so when you say, well, what is a thinker in residence? They basically let me write whatever I want, which is lovely. It, it feels great to be able to do this. So I wanted to um, describe what it's like to uh, be um, attacked by rice kings. I think we know this term, right? Um, is when uh, people who are like, who really like to fetishize uh, Asian women. I've never heard of this. I've never heard of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, here we go. There is nothing small 
about microaggressions. This term, coined by Harvard professor Chester Mid Middlebrook Pierce, means the casual degradation of any social socially marginalized group. The key word here is casual. So not micro as in small, but micro as in casual. And casual as in casual to the oppressor. As in, my friend went to the Philippines and told me that Filipinos are so very soft-spoken and polite. In all, my almost 40 years of life, my favorite microaggression is this one. I was the owner of a home daker, so I frequented the playgrounds near my house. I was sitting on the ground watching my charge take turns on the slide when an adorable toddler waddled towards me. He was smiling ear to ear, and when I reached out my arms to him, he actually went into my arms. I was delighted. Aren't you a friendly munchkin, I said to him, as his father approached, also smiling with his hands in his pockets. Yeah, he can't help it. He loves Asian women. It's his thing. It's his thing? Oh my god. I was so honored. I had just met the world's youngest rice king. I wasn't sure if I should bow deeply before him or fetch my shamisen to play like a geisha while he enjoyed his tea. I wondered how this kid's dad arrived at this theory that his son was a rice king. Did he catch him googling hot Filipina on his Fisher Price toy laptop? Did he refuse to breastfeed on pink nipples and did he prefer brown ones? I mean, what the hell, right? As an Asian woman, this conversation is typical. You're at a bar and some guy leans into you and says, hey, I don't detect an accent. Are you from here? But I'm imagining this toddler coming at me at the play center, removing his pacifier from his mouth and saying, Hey, I'm a nina machina male. I'm a nina. Oh, just the sound of that, it makes me hot. It makes me want to shake off the yoke of my oppressive culture and love you long time. <laughs> a man said exactly that to me once in a pizza place. I was alone enjoying my pizza because I was about to get my period and it was either I eat pizza or I, I kill somebody. And he sits at the table next to me and he says, I heard you order a pizza. I don't detect an accent. Are you from here? You know, just because of the way that I look, that surely I'm not from Toronto. And let me remind you that I was 24 hours from bleeding. Uh, like the creepy twins from The Shining were at my crotch waiting for the elevator doors to open and for the blood to just come out of me like the evil waterfall. Okay, so I just looked at him and I belched. <laughs> I mean, why would I waste my time with a witty comeback? Why get angry when I can simply share with him the gas from my body? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we do have time. Oh, you uh, time yourself very well, but we started oh, no, a little no, bit please. early. I want to be able to. I want to keep it nice and okay. short and sweet. Okay, Thank we'll come you. back to you, right? Thank you, Rini. Really. Yeah. Okay. So, the next person is. Uh, sorry, this is kind of awkward. Um, the writer sitting right next to me, Jenny Chang. Um, Jenny writes historical novels with a supernatural twist. Set in, the 20th, uh, set in the early 20th century China, her books draw inspiration from family stories about her ancestors and life in China before the Second World War. Her debut novel, Three Souls, was a finalist for the 2014 BC Book Prizes Fiction Award and one of nine Canadian novels nominated for the 2015 uh, IMPAC Dublin Literary Award. And today, we're going to hear from her about her latest book, Dragon Spring Rose Road, which I was trying to get a copy of, and I could not get my hands on any copy in the public yes. library. I was going to buy one from the bookstore, and I said, no, I wait till I get an autograph copy that I buy here. Okay, so um, off to you. Thank you, Winnie, and be assured, everyone, I've timed this eight minutes. Okay. Um, my second novel, Dragon Springs Road, begins in 1908 in one of the empty courtyards of an estate outside Shanghai, where a seven-year-old girl named Jia Ling waits for her mother to come back for her as promised, but she's been waiting for three days. A new family moves into the estate, 
and the daughter of the house, whose name is Andrian, finds the little girl and brings her to see the family's ultimate authority, her grandmother. The novel is written in the first person, and that person is Jaline, the little girl. So I'm going to read a short section here. You must call her grandmother Yang, Andrian whispered. We entered a room on the ground floor. Members of the household were already gathered, all talking at once. I'd never seen so many people in one place at one time. So she's the one the neighbors heard crying, said the young woman with a round belly. There, you see, first wife, there's no ghost. Our new home isn't haunted. She's an unlucky omen, the other woman replied. She seemed much older, or perhaps it was her thin figure and sour face, her look of discontent. Andrian led me to the far end of the room where an elderly woman rested on a day bed. She beckoned, and Andrian gave me a small push. Grandmother Yang's face was gaunt, papery skin pulled tight over her cheekbones, fine wrinkles around her eyes. She had the same eyes as her granddaughter, alert and deep set. Her trousers and tunic were of plain fabric, a row of black knot buttons, the only ornamentation across her dove gray bodice. There wasn't a hint of needlework on her wide cuffs. Then I noticed her tiny shoes, which dangled on feet that didn't quite touch the floor. They were red satin, lavishly embroidered. The old woman looked me up and down. Who is your family? She tapped her finger on the bed frame, waiting for my reply. I looked up pleadingly at Andrian, who answered. Her family name is Zhu. Her name is Jialing. She says she lived with her mother in the main house of the Western residence. We bought this estate from a man called Fong, not Zhu. The old woman frowned and lifted my chin with one finger. She studied my face. First wife, give me your handkerchief. The sour-faced woman hurried over from the doorway, a handkerchief held out in her thin fingers. Grandmother Yang dipped the cloth into a cup of cold tea on the tray beside her and wiped my face. She looked again more closely. I thought so. Zazong. There were gasps. First wife hissed. It seemed as though the entire room crowded around me, turning me around to stare, to prod, and exclaim. I didn't know what Zazong meant, only that suddenly my presence caused fascination and disgust. For those of you who don't speak Mandarin, <laughs> Zazong is a very derogatory term for mixed blood. So Jialing is biracial, she's Eurasian. And in that time and place, she's <coughs> destined to grow up rejected by Chinese and Westerners alike. So the new family takes in Jialing as a bond servant. Yes, we're talking child labor. But still, it seemed to me that someone in her position, so unfortunate, would need nothing less than supernatural intervention to survive. And without much encouragement, a fox spirit knows her way into the story. I'm sure that every member of the audience familiar with Japanese, Chinese, or Korean pop culture knows about fox spirits, those shape-shifting uh, creatures that can turn into beautiful women. So I'm going to read from a section that describes what happens when fox shows Jia Ling how it feels to be a fox. And in this scene, it's nighttime, and the little girl is sitting in the courtyard with fox. I wish I were a fox, I said. Then my life would be easier. Can you make me a fox? Such a small person, such big ideas, she said. And a moment later, I was no longer in the courtyard. There were leaves overhead, and I was looking out through a tangle of shrubs Two black paws stretched in front of me. Were those my feet? I settled inside this memory, seeing what Fox wanted to show me. I was myself, and I was also Fox. And then, I look out on fields frosted with dew, the sky hazy with moonlight dimmed by a wash of clouds. Overhead, the high-pitched chittering of bats as they swoop and dive in the air. I stand and stretch, and from the shrubbery come rustles of alarm, small creatures alerted to my presence. 
The ditch I follow meanders along the perimeters of fields. I come to a path, overgrown and invisible to human eyes, but I can see where the dirt is trampled from years of being trod by human feet. At the end of the path is a large bamboo grove, the edges of a cottage just visible. It's been deserted for many decades, but the bamboo has flourished, surrounding the farmyard and growing right up to the cottage. Morning glory smothers the straw roof, closed buds of white waiting to bloom with sunrise. There's nothing left of the people who lived here, no furniture or utensils, just some bricks blackened from cooking fires. Pushed and buried into one corner are rags wrapped around the small bones of a baby girl abandoned when the family fled from poverty or war, who's to know? Fox has been coming for years, but has never seen her ghost, such a tiny thing. No doubt her souls pass straight into the afterlife, but I offer a brief prayer to the gods anyway. Outside, a scrabbling sound and the beat of wings. An owl rises up from the fields, its hoot of triumph drowning out despairing squeaks, a field mouse caged in its claws. The sky turns from charcoal gray to indigo, then a lighter blue as sunrise paints the undersides of clouds. Birds call out, cautiously at first, then with more assurance. I trot home, treading my way between brambles and undergrowth until I reach the back wall of the western residence to the spot where fallen bricks leave a gap. Once inside the courtyard, I enter the den beneath the veranda behind the white hydrangea shrubs. And then, I woke up in my cot, birdsong coming in through the window. I held up my hands, and they were just hands, palms and fingers of soft skin, the nails flat and thin, useless for the hunt. I was no longer a fox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. You guys are so disciplined. Everybody makes my, my job very easy. I don't even have to check the clock, right, which is right there. So <laughs> we will move immediately onto the third book. This is really like a big feast, and uh, I've built up a good appetite oh. for the next few days. <laughs> and uh, I've already read your book. I know what it's about, but I'd like to hear directly from you. And uh, so here's the very short bio that I'm going to read. Jen Suk Fong Lee is a popular radio personality, having written for CBC Radio 1 on the coast and all points west for three years. Her first novel, The End of East, was published in, 20, uh, in uh, 2007 and in 2011 saw the release of Shelter, her first fiction for young adults as part of the Anik Press Single Voices series. And her third novel, The Conjoined, which you're going to hear about, um, was published just last fall. Already, it's been named one of the best 99 books, I understand. Y yes. Very good. Congratulations. It is that good. No. <laughs> um, Jen was born and raised in East Vancouver but now she lives in North Burnaby with her son and a dog. I don't know why that got into that little bio. <laughs> My dog actually died yesterday. Oh, no. I, I know, I know, you guys. I'm gonna, I actually am gonna read a section from The Conjoined, which all of my books have dogs in them. Um, and if, I feel like someone's gonna write a PhD thesis on this. And, because um, of course, why wouldn't you? Um, and, uh, cause I miss her so. She died very suddenly, she was great. You guys, don't be too sad, she was 13 and a half. Um, I think she had a stroke and she just kind of died and she was at home with me, so it was all right. She died very peacefully. She was a lovely dog. Her name was Molly. I also thank her in all the acknowledgements in all of my books. And um, anyway, um, so, um, and okay, this is the last story I'll tell you about my dog, is that when I sold my first um, novel, The End of East, um, and my agent phoned and it was like seven in the morning and you know uh, she said we sold your novel and this is how much money they're giving you and I had a fit on the phone um, and then my my ex-husband picked up my dog's front paws and they danced around the kitchen um, and Molly had no idea why she was dancing but she's like cool that's great 
Any t- anything for a celebration. That's my dog, Molly. Um, so The Conjoined, which is my most recent novel, um, is uh, the story of a social worker. Her name is Jessica Campbell, and she um, is cleaning out her mother's, um, her recently deceased mother's um, house. And she goes into the basement and um, to clean the freezers, and she discovers two dead bodies in the deep chest freezers in the basement. Yeah, I know, right? Why not start a novel with dead bodies? And so uh, part of the reason I wrote this book is I actually read a news item on um, uh, uh, online about a, a woman who had fostered children. Uh, and when she died, um, they found two dead bodies in her freezers. And as it turned out, in, in real life, she had moved several times since those two foster children had gone missing. So she had always taken them with her the, the um, bodies and the freezers. Um, and so because I'm kind of a psychopath, I read it and I thought, well, I'm going to write a novel about that. That's awesome. Um, so that's how I started writing The Conjoined. And um, I worked in social services for many years. Um, uh, it was my day job before um, I started doing other things like writing books. And um, one of the things that I was always really interested in is that in social services, it's usually... Um, Um, The people who are social workers are most often white women, and they're called upon to usually enter the homes of people from every community. Um, And there was a very steep learning curve in terms of cultural things and and what sort of Canadian ideals of what good parenting is and people from other communities and what their ideals of good parenting are. Um, And so I was always really interested in how the social workers, who were all really lovely people, the ones that I knew, Um, really navigated that and really tried and also how many of those families fell between the cracks because there were so many gaps and barriers in communication and in access to resources and those sorts of things. So in the conjoined um, with girls who go missing, um, I've made them Chinese Canadian from what we used to call Skid Row, which they now call the downtown east side. Um, And they're 13 and 14 years old when they disappear. Um, so I'm going to read you a section. The first section I'm going to read you is the one about the dog. Um, so Jessica, after she finds these bodies, she goes on this, um, sort of, she, she starts to investigate on her own, um, what might have happened to the bodies, who these girls were. They end up being, they were girls that, um, her, her family had fostered when she was a child. So she has memories of them. Um, and she goes on this search to figure out how they could have ended up this way. Um, and one of the things that she discovers is that, um, the older one, Casey, may or may not have had um, an ill-advised love affair with um, a, a grown man who was the best friend of her father. Um, and so uh, Jessica goes looking for him. His name is Wayne, um, who may or may not have been the boyfriend of one of the girls who disappears. And this is, this is and I'm solely reading this because there's a dog in it, um, but you can humor me for like three pages. And then I'll get into the real stuff. She stood in the doorway under a stained, once white awning and shivered as the rain dripped around her and onto the sidewalk. The apartments were on the second floor, above a bakery that looked like it hadn't been opened since 2007. Across the street, a car wash and a series of produce markets and convenience stores, all with windows fogged over with condensation. Jessica had pressed the buzzer once already and was trying to decide whether she should press it again when a female voice crackled through the air. Hello? Yes, hello, my name is Jessica. I'm a social worker. I'm looking for Wayne. She winced as she said this, knowing that she wasn't lying, but was instead fuzzing the truth just enough. Wayne doesn't live here anymore. Do you know where he's gone? Ten seconds of silence. Then, why? I need to ask him some questions about a case I'm working on. Please? Jessica's voice rose. It involves children. Hang on, I'll come down. A woman in her fifties emerged from the stairwell, wearing a chocolate brown tracksuit and pink flip-flops. Her yellowish graying hair was twisted into a collapsing bun on the top of her head, and she held a black skinny dog in her arms. She stared at Jessica through the glass doors for a moment before twisting the locks open. She stood half in and half out, her hip resting on the edge of the door. What'd you say your name was? The dog sniffed in Jessica's direction and bared his teeth. Jessica? A kid, huh? Wayne never had any kids. Jessica pulled her jacket tighter against the wind whipping toward them. It's not about a child that he was ever taking care of. It's an old case. She could see that the woman was waiting for her to continue and was not going to answer any questions until she was satisfied it was worth her time. He was friends with the family until the children went into foster care. The woman narrowed her eyes. With her face drawn in, she and the dog looked so alike that Jessica wanted to laugh. The dog growled. Did he do something to them? No. Well, not anything illegal. That sounds about right. Wayne never actually did anything illegal. Maybe they were wrong or stupid, but never illegal. She shifted the dog to her right arm and reached into the pocket of her hoodie. 
I haven't talked to him in two years, not since his mom died. She left him the house, you know, and a bunch of insurance money, so he didn't need me anymore. She laughed, but then started coughing. Sorry. Don't apologize. She scrolled through a phone. He, there, his parents' address. I don't know why I even still have this in here. It's not like I go over for tea. She read off a number in a street in Strathcona, just east of Chinatown. Thanks so much. I'm sorry. I didn't even ask for your name. The woman smiled and swept a strand of hair off of her face. It's Heather. You can tell that shit stain that I still hate his ass, but Pluto here says hello. At the sound of his name, the little dog barked before Heather stepped backward and let the door fall shut again. Pluto. Oh, Pluto. Um, so what ends up happening is Jessica goes looking for Wayne and, and um, she finds him. And he starts telling her his story of um, when he knew these girls, which would have been about 26 years earlier in 1988. So this is our introduction to Wayne. Wayne woke up in his parents' house and pulled on his dirty lead jeans from the night before. He ate breakfast by himself in front of the television as his father silently packed his toolbox for work. There was nothing to say, really, because all of their conversations began or ended with his father yelling in Cantonese, you need to get a job and move out. So Wayne just watched Norm Perry read the news and said nothing while his father slammed and locked the front door. His mother was scrubbing the kanji pot in the kitchen. He brought his cereal bowl to the sink and kissed her on the cheek. She grunted but leaned her body into him, the best hug she could manage with her hands covered in rubber gloves. Wayne put on his cracked leather jacket and shoes and went into the backyard where he smoked two cigarettes while staring at the drying leaves on the cherry tree next door. That afternoon, Bill came by in his rusty secondhand Buick. You want to go for a ride? He yelled from the open window. Wayne jumped in and they careened around the corner as Wayne's mother watched from the front step, hands on her hips. They drove and drove through downtown and across the bridge, past the fancy shopping mall and along the water. The houses had enormous windows, like blind, unblinking eyes pointed toward the inlet. The sun was thick but cold, as it often is in the fall, but both men had their windows rolled down, the wind circling through the car, whistling through the fabric of their sleeves. Did you ever notice that the ocean out here doesn't smell like anything? Wayne shouted. No, Bill said, smirking. When you go to New Brighton or down by the train tracks, you can smell fish and wood and salt. Out here, it's just fucking clean. You notice the weirdest shit. And it was true, Wayne did notice the weirdest shit. Everywhere he looked, there was something to see, something to tuck into his brain for the future moment when he would notice something else that would turn into that one old remembered detail into an epiphany. As he sat in Bill's car, he thought about how here, in West Vancouver, the waterfront was pristine and lined with tidy houses with gardens cleaner than his jacket. Not six blocks from his parents' house east of Chinatown, the waterfront was dirty, littered with the garbage of work, split and gnarled two-by-fours, styrofoam coffee cups, puddles of spilled motor oil. What was the difference? It was the same water, but long ago someone decided which portion would be worth looking at and which would be used to power and clean the plants and refineries and shipping containers. It seemed unfair to him, but he couldn't figure out why. Bill turned left onto a small road that was poorly paved. Wayne could reach out and touch the cliffs on the side if he wanted, but he kept his hands in the car. He didn't trust nature. Plants could make you itch. Animals and bugs hid in every crevice. Where are we going? He asked quietly, in a voice that could have been a child's. Bill threw a cigarette out the window. Lighthouse Park, ever been? No, Wayne had never been. He had kept at the familiar confines of downtown East Vancouver and sometimes Chinatown if his mother wanted him to help with the groceries. He thought of Stanley Park and its well-ordered seawall and rose garden and bowling lawn, but he knew just by staring at this park's gate, painted and green and looped with rusted chains that may very well have been chewed on by bears, that this was something wilder. As they walked on the uneven paths, kicking aside pine cones and fallen branches, Wayne briefly thought about running back through the trees and into the car. He would feel less buried there, less held against his will by the darkness of the tall firs and spruces. But he kept up, not wanting to disappoint Bill, who strode along without hesitation, as if he weren't an immigrant East Van boy with a Chinese accent he had uselessly tried to erase. As if he had grown up in a forest with squirrels and whatever bird that was calling like the three-note chime of the shiny white sky train. Finally, they burst through the woods and stood on a flat, wide rock. Ocean and more ocean, a sailboat, the lighthouse on a point farther west. Wayne swallowed, trying not to throw up. You see, said Bill, sometimes you need to get out of the city to get some perspective. Wayne's perspective had never included parks that clung to the edges of cliffs, where nothing stood between you and the raging water below. He wasn't sure he wanted it to. It's beautiful, right? Wayne cleared his throat. Sure. A spider floated down on a thread and landed delicately on Wayne's nose. At home, if a spider touched him, he would swat it away immediately, not caring if its carcass lay on the floor of his bedroom for one day or three weeks. But here he let it crawl over his nostril, his right cheek, and down to his jaw. 
He thought he could feel its little feet pricking his skin, feeling with its legs the strange soft human underneath. When Wayne finally breathed, the spider lifted off on his exhale and away. He tried to find it among the cracks in the rock he was standing on, but he saw nothing, only bits of moss and pebbles that could have been spiders but weren't. He had lost it, but he still felt the trail of its movement on his face. It was unbearable, feeling the smallest touch like this as if his skin had been stripped off and he was nothing but nerves in the sunshine. He didn't feel like throwing up anymore, but he wasn't sure this was better. Rubbing his hands over his eyes, he tried to remember the cockroaches and geckos that had crawled over the floors of his family's old grubby apartment in Hong Kong, but he couldn't conjure them up. He was five when they had left, and the memories often shifted and faded until he was no longer sure if they were real or made up. Bill turned. Had enough? You look ready to get the fuck out of here. Wayne nodded. What should we do now? Let's go back downtown and get some lunch, and I should go see my girls tonight. Jenny leaves for the night shift at nine. We'll bring some beer. Beer? For the girls? Bill let out a roaring laugh, sharp and explosive. No, dumbass, it's for us. The girls will fall asleep by ten, and then we can have a little party. You in? Wayne nodded again. He had nothing else to do. Might as well tag along, watch his friend play with his daughters, and drink. If he played this right, he wouldn't see his parents again until tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wow, thank you. There's something about um, reading something that's reflected back to you, something that's very familiar. So hearing about Vancouver and different parts of Vancouver, reading about it is uh, one of those pleasures. Um, and also reading about, you know, uh, in English literature, and I was brought up on that, um, we seldom would be reading experiences that some of us experience. And, you know, reading our Asian writers' work, that is an added dimension that I didn't get to realize until I've reflected on it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for working so hard to bring us the, uh, your rendition of uh, life experienced. Thank you. Um, so our fourth writer today, uh, today we are we are launching your book that is non-fiction, different from the others. But when I first met Julia, we were busy promoting her fiction work. And I never got to know how to say the name of the book properly because I wasn't sure whether it is from Taiwanese or Mandarin. Could you say that for us? It's Taiwanese. It's Mia, which means fate in Taiwanese. So that was your first fictional piece of uh, book. And today, we are, um, uh, we, we are promoting your non-fictional work, which had a big splash, make a big splash in September at the Taiwan Fest. <laughs> yes, it was good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I won't say more about your book, because you're going to tell us. So just a very short bio. I don't think this is uh, doing you justice. But I'll just read it. Uh, Julia Lin was born in Taiwan and lived there and in Vietnam before her family came to Canada when she was nine. Since then, Julia has lived in Vancouver, Toronto, and even northern BC. She holds a graduate degree in immunology as well as um, a postgraduate degree in computing education. And she has taught high school math and science in BC. I think you're still teaching, right? I am. Yeah. I so you're today. a full-time teacher, and yet you've got time to do all the research and writing. So we need to find out the secrets from you. How did uh, you manage that? No sleep? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Should I get closer? Thank you. So I am a fiction writer. So I, I feel like I belong here with these lovely people. Uh, the only reason, my, this was my first foray into nonfiction. And the reason I, I wrote this book was because after Mia uh, was published, the uh, president of the Taiwanese Historical Society asked me if I would write something about the Taiwanese in North America. And at first I thought, OK, I'll go through all these 60 videotapes that they had already made of the Taiwanese immigrants in BC. And I thought, no, I can't do justice to anybody. So I just chose one person to write about. And the, the subject of the biography is uh, Dr. Charles Yang. He was a physician in Richmond for uh, many years, 30 years. The um, reason I chose him was because he's outspoken. So that's number one. And the second reason was he had a very unusual Manchurian childhood. Um, 
He was born in 1932 to Taiwanese parents, and he moved to Manchu Guo, the name for the Japanese-controlled puppet state of Manchuria, when he was only two. He grew up thinking he was Japanese, despite being treated like a Japanese citizen, uh, like a second-class citizen, uh, by the Japanese because the Taiwanese were the colonized. And in 1945, after Russia invaded Manchuria at the end of the Second World War, Yang fled to Taiwan with his family. There, he did not find peace. He found the national, the Chinese nationalists, and um, they were a pretty brutal regime. So they put Taiwan under martial law for 38 years. When he was 27, Yang escaped with his wife and children to the United States, where he continued his medical training. And then in 1965, he immigrated to Canada. He began working for Richmond General Hospital when it opened in 1966. And he's 85 now. He has, suffers from um, slowly progressing ALS. So, uh, but he continues to be one of the most respected elders in the Taiwanese Canadian community. Um, when I was writing this book, I, I felt this pressure to finish because First of all, Dr. Yang uh, didn't know how long he would survive if he would see the publication of the book. And also because the president of the Taiwanese Canadian Association who had invited me to write the book passed away. So I, I felt like I had to honor the promise I'd made to him. Anyway, so the book is out and uh, I will read an excerpt from it now. So the event uh, that I'm going to uh, tell you about, took place right after the Russian invasion of Manchuria at the end of World War II. Dr. Yang was a young child at the time, so here he is in, in, on the cover uh, wearing the Japanese uniform that they had to wear to school. His father was also a doctor, and uh, the Taiwanese were encouraged to change uh, their names to Japanese names, so at that time, uh, Manchuria was still under Japanese rule, so they took the name Takayama. Uh, he had a clinic in Tailing in China, and um, after the invasion, he kept the family inside the house because nobody knew what was going to happen, and they, there was no way out at that time. All of the railroads had stopped and the ships weren't sailing, so it was a really difficult time. So now the invasion occurred in August of 1945, and now it's the middle of the winter. When the loud knocking sounded at noon, Dr. Takayama assumed it was one of his acquaintances. He would not have dared to open the door at night. Akahisa and his younger brother, Tadahisa, trailed behind their father as he opened the door. A blast of icy air hit them, and they found themselves staring into the barrel of a pistol. It was the first time Akahisa had ever seen a gun up close. The gaping black hole of the metallic instrument held him spellbound. His eyes widened, and he found himself unable to breathe. Dr. Takayama took a surprise step back into the foyer and nearly knocked Akahisa over. The two uniformed Russian soldiers pushed their way in and closed the door. To Akahisa, they were gigantic. Both clean-shaven, one wore the khaki uniform of the lower ranks, the other looked like an officer. He had on a fur hat and wore a clean gray coat with shiny brass buttons on top of his SARS green uniform. It was he who trained the gun on Dr. Takayama. Chetsi! The officer tapped his left wrist three times with the tip of his handgun, then swiftly pointed the pistol back at the family. Dr. Takayama did not move. Akahisa noticed his father's right hand was shaking. He had never seen his father so frightened before. This was the same man whom Akahisa had once seen suturing his own big toe without anesthetic after accidentally stepping on a broken bottle the same man who had so ably kept their family from harm all through the war. His father's fear heightened Akahisa's terror. He grasped his younger brother's hand and edged back toward the wall. The movement seemed to irritate the officer, and he aimed the gun at the children. The officer pushed his way past the Takayamas toward the bedrooms. Dr. Takayama looked after him worriedly, but there was little he could do. Chetsi! 
the officer yelled. He caught the pistol. Akahisa's hands felt damp, but he didn't know if the moisture originated with him or his brother. Dr. Takayama quickly removed the watch from his wrist and handed it to the man. The officer examined the watch and slipped it into his coat pocket. Of course, Akahisa thought. He had heard so many stories of how the Russian soldiers loved watches. Some had collections that covered the lengths of their arms. Now that they've gotten what they came for, maybe they'll leave. Akahisa let out his breath and relaxed his hold on Tadahisa. But the two men were not finished. The soldiers stomped with their dirty hide boots throughout the house, looking under tatami mats and empty drawers, searching for other valuables. There was little to take by this point. Much of what the family owned had gone toward financing the necess necessities of life, food and fuel. The wartime rations, oops, sorry, <laughs> I lost that page. Um, the wartime rations that uh, they had depended on were now luxuries. Akahisa had heard of people who burned asphalt in order to stay warm. Luckily, their family had not reached that stage. Dr. Takayama followed the men at a distance as they made their way through the house. For the first time, Akahisa wondered how his father had managed to keep their family alive and how they would survive without the head of the household. So this was the first part of the book. The book is divided in, into three parts. First part is Manchuria, second part is Taiwan, and the third part is North America. So when Dr. Da uh, Yang, he, Charles Yang, uh, no, long, no longer called Takayama, um, came to North America, he got involved in the Taiwanese democracy independence movement, and this scene describes one of his activities. January 1980, Seattle, Washington. As the bus traveled toward downtown parking lot, he accepted the white cardboard mask from his seatmate and pressed it to his face. The stiff paper of the mask grated against his bearded chin and brushed against his specta spectacle lenses. The world before him blurred as he took off his thick glasses. His severe myopia had been both a curse and a blessing throughout his life. It had saved him from military service, but it had also restricted his daily activities. Just once, he would like to wake up to a world in sharp focus. Today, though, he was very clear in his purpose. His four-decade long for belonging, his four-decade search for belonging was over. He was now firmly in one camp. His sojourns in Taiwan, Manchuria, America, and Canada had led him to this spot. His various identities, Akahisa Takayama, Masaaki Takayama, Yang Chen Chao, C.C. Yang, Charles Yang, were now inextricably fused into this one persona. No, not a persona, his true self. The mask was crude and flimsy. Someone had cut out holes for the eyes and mouth, but breathing would be difficult. Charles considered widening the mouth hole to reach his nose, but there were no instruments at hand. It wasn't like in the operating room where he could have scissors passed to him on command. He sighed and put, on the, put the elastic over his head and then adjusted it to secure the mask. He was used to surgical masks, but he had never worn anything like this uncomfortable homemade one. His father's admonitions against getting involved in politics reverberated dimly at the back of his mind. Charles believed the mass would offer protection. Besides, the cause was just. Everyone on this crowded bus of 40 passengers felt the same way, but no one wanted to expose himself, man or woman. The risks were too great, not only to themselves, but to their families and friends back in Taiwan. They had seen the consequences of defiance, jail, torture, and even murder by the government. Still, there was no other option. He lifted his glasses from his lap and hinged them over the mask. Despite the seriousness of the cause, there was lightheartedness as well, camaraderie among friends. Their identities masked, they were safe to lodge their protests against injustice. Some of them were even laughing and joking. Charles, too, felt safe behind his thin cardboard of a mask. 
The bus stopped with a jolt, and Charles's glasses hinged on top of the smooth white car cardboard mask over his face began to slip, so he quickly removed both and switched the order. With the mask on top of his glasses, his peripheral vision was greatly impeded, but at least it was better than the glasses falling off completely. He made his way off the chartered bus with the others and was hit by a blast of chilly air. He zipped up his winter jacket and pulled on his gloves, glad the afternoon was clear. It would have been a miserable protest if typical winter rains had prevailed. The Seattle organizers and their contingent were waiting in the open air parking lot. Placards were distributed, homemade cardboard signs mounted on foot-long wooden sticks. His sign read, Stop Religious Prosecution in Taiwan. A woman wearing a plaid coat had one that said, Taiwan belongs to Taiwanese. Others had similar messages such as, Stop Political Repression in Taiwan and Free Hundreds of Dissidents and Clergymen in Taiwan. The group of about 75 Taiwanese Canadians Americans garnered curious glances from shoppers as they marched from the downtown parking lot to the corner of 3rd and James Street, arriving at the Lion Building. The rick brick structure with its terracotta frieze and cornices housed five stories of offices above a row of shops on the street level. One of the offices belonged to the KMT, the Guomindang. Charles and the other demonstrators milled in front of the building, blocking the sloping sidewalk. Several office, police officers guarded the entrance to the building. There had apparently been some, been some damage to the lobby at another demonstration the month before. Charles watched as a group of protesters made their way across the street to the Seattle Public Safety Building. Photographers, reporters, and policemen began arriving. The photographer from the Seattle Times had already snapped a picture of the march earlier. And I'll leave you with that because I think I'm over my eight minutes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, all of you. Um, I'll be remiss if I do not mention this. Um, Jim would be so happy tonight to see Catherine actually here. She was the winner of the Emerging Writers Award last year. Was it last year only? Yeah, 2000, that, that's right, yes. And uh, so congratulations, and now I can do that personally. And. Um, so you're in good company, such as Madeline Tian, who also started with our Emerging Writers Award that really launched her career. Um, so I thought I should mention this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what follows is, as the moderator, I am given the privilege to ask the first question uh, so that you can start warming up and consider the question you want to ask, OK? So, um, now, Julia's book is nonfiction, so of course you would be engaged in a lot of research. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it would be a matter of how do you choose from all the material that you have got in hand, right? So my question to all of you, if you choose to respond, is what role does research play in writing this book that we're talking today? Anyone want to start? Okay. Um. Well, I write historical fiction, so there's always research involved. And um, I think that one of the fatal mistakes you can make as a writer is to do too much research because, I mean, I write historical fiction because I love history. So you can delude yourself into believing you're doing really productive work and just do research and read and you know watch Chinese movies set in a particular period of time you know and um, and actually what's happened is you've gone down this huge rabbit hole and you have over researched and maybe 10% of what you research is actually going to go into the book and you haven't actually written a single word, but boy, have you done your research. <laughs> That's a very good warning. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, anyone else? No. I'll, Julie. I'll, um, because this was a nonfiction book, I, I did have to do a lot of research. And um, this book actually came out a lot thinner than I thought because my editor cut out a lot of the <laughs> factual historical background. He just didn't think um, 
it would be engaging enough, it would be too much of a textbook, but I like to set things where they belong. So I wanted to make sense of the events that were happening to this family and set it within the context of the war and what Jap Japanese thinking was at that time. And I learned a lot doing the, especially the part about the Manchurian experience because there is, even in Taiwan and in Japan, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, knowledge about this period in their history. And um, you know, I learned about how the Japanese settlers that went to Manchuria um, expected to prosper and then this surprise attack by the Russians just destroyed everything and they were stranded there for a whole winter so many many people died and so yeah it was very white it was an eye-opening experience and I think um, because it's nonfiction, I had to if I were writing it as a fiction book I think I would still have read it uh, just out of curiosity because it's such an interesting topic for me Jen? Hi. Uh, um, for me, research it has a lot to do with um, sort of the periods that I'm writing, and most of my books are set, you know, sort of contemporary Vancouver, but there's also a bit set in here in the 1980s and some other stuff sort of post-World War II. Um, and what's real, always been really important to me was to get a, is to always get a visual sense of what um, Vancouver specifically looked like, you know, uh, 30 years ago or 50 years ago. Because Vancouver has changed a lot, as we know, and sort of the Vancouver that we see today is not the same Vancouver that um, Jamie and Casey would have been running around in in 1988. Um, and for that, I always turn to the photographs of Fred Herzog, which have always helped me tremendously. Um, and with this book, um, I was also um, looking at sort of the older work of Jeff Wall, who who is another um, Vancouver photographer. And um, all those really helped me get into that mindset. Um, the other thing about writing a novel that has dead bodies in it is you have to research dead bodies. Um, my Google search history is terrible. And, and these are frozen bodies. And it occurred to me that in order for an autopsy to occur, they had to defrost. So then I had to look up defrosting frozen bodies. And you know, people they must think I'm a serial killer, to be honest. But it's fine. I wiped it clean. There's nothing left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just Google it just, just to see what happens. What do you get? It's disgusting. I recommend you don't do it. Um, and yeah, and then so yeah, police procedural stuff, which was again something that I had to look into in sort of social work stuff. But luckily for me, I'd worked in social services for a long time. So I really just interviewed my old boss, which was I bought him lunch and asked him a bunch of questions. Catherine? For this particular book, my research was just a, there's a lot of conversations with people uh, because of the fact that it is about a particular community. It meant sharing space with people in a way that was respectful, that I was receiving uh, the truths of their lives, usually over shared meals, and respecting their privacy. Uh, and then um, having people who I felt were sort of my team of people to check me on certain perspectives, specifically cultural perspectives, that I made sure that um, they were, uh, there was an agreement between us uh, as to like, for example, there's certain, yeah, there's like certain people who are, for example, Trinidadian or um, people from uh, the indigenous community, uh, from the Mi'kmaq community, is that I wanted to make sure that it was uh, sensitive towards those communities and I was, uh, that they could trust me. So I wanted to um, have them, they would read over the material that I had and I would make sure that there was an agreement between us as to what the uh, appropriate exchange would be for their time because of the fact that that's emotional labor and I wanted to make sure that uh, they were paid for their time. And, that, and when I say paid, it could have been money or if it was agreed that it was more like a, a meal that I had created for them or a loaf of bread that we shared um, that I had made for them uh, because it was really important for me to make sure that the people from these cultures reading this book that they would feel that they were respected. And so far, um, it has been, it's been pretty successful. Okay, 